Hey guys, welcome back to Pop 'em Up Chem. We're going to be carrying on with our work on gases today and looking at the ideal gas law in particular to explore what happens if we don't have the consistent conditions required for the molar volume of a gas. So, we're going to be looking at what the ideal gas law is, the terms and the units describe the interaction between the different terms and then we're going to look at evaluating some problems using that equation. As always though, to get us started, got a refresh question based on the molar volume of a gas. It's a paper one question, so try not to use a calculator and pause the video to have a go at it. Right, let's have a little look through that. So remember with our paper one questions, there's always going to be a shortcut, hopefully anyway. So we've got 40 centimetres cubed of sulphur dioxide multiplied by 2 over 2 would give us 40 centimetres cubed of sulphur trioxide. But if we also use the oxygen, we see that we would get the same because neither in this case is the limiting reactant. So the answer is B, whichever way you end up looking at it. So although in last lesson we did look at linking moles to volume, the big asterisk over that was the fact that we had to have very specific conditions and we had to know the molar volume of a gas at those conditions, which is why that equation doesn't appear in our mole journey. What does is this ideal gas law and the ideal gas law allows us to account for different conditions, even changing conditions within a reaction. Let's just quickly recap ideal gases and have a look at the equation. So as discussed in the last video, ideal gases have particles that occupy no volume and have zero intermolecular forces. Now, this is not particularly valid in certain areas, such as low temperature and high pressure. And when we consider low temperature, this may make more sense because at a low temperature, particles are moving a lot more slowly. They're not whizzing past each other as quickly and so that any interaction the molecules do have is going to become more significant. The same in a way is also true of high pressure. When all the particles are far away, the particles occupying no volume does not massively affect the calculation, whereas when they are closer, it does. So each of these problems relates to one of the assumptions that we make. So with that in mind, what does the ideal gas equation look like? Well, it's usually given in the form of PV equals nRT, where P is equal to pressure in pascals, V is equal to volume in meters cubed, N is our trusty old moles, given, of course, in moles, R is the universal gas constant, which has the units joules per kelvin per mole and always has the value 8.31 as it's given in the data booklet. And lastly, we have T, which is temperature and that's recorded in kelvin. Sometimes the hardest part of this equation can be the units. So we're going to have a look at each of these units in turn and show you how to make sure you have standard SI units, which are used throughout this equation. So we have PV equals nRT. Let's start with pressure. So pressure's units are given in pascals. So you can have things given to you in kilopascals, which is 1000 pascals is a kilopascal. So for example, if I have 101 kilopascals, then I'm going to need to multiply that value by 1000 to be able to convert that into pascals, which in this case would be 101,000 pascals. So things to watch for in questions and online is one atmosphere, which equals 101,000 pascals, was given as STP pre-1982. So do just watch. If you see one atmosphere, it's just referring to 101,000 pascals. Also, one bar, the modern equivalent of this, is 100,000 pascals, and that is, of course, STP pressure. 
For those that are curious or have ever pumped up a bike tire, they'll know the term PSI. So one PSI is equivalent to 6,894.76 pascals, just for a reference scale there. Next in line, we have volume. So in this equation, volume is given as meters cubed. So to give scale and reference there, 1,000 centimeters cubed is a decimeter and 1,000 decimeters cubed is a meter cubed. So a pretty large volume. Now the way we can convert between this is if we want to go from centimeters to decimeters cubed, as you already know, you're going to need to divide by 1,000. So you then just need to divide by a further 1,000 to get to meters cubed. Now to go in the other direction, to go from meters cubed all the way back down to centimeters cubed, is multiplied by 1,000 and 1,000 again. So for example, 25 centimeters cubed is going to be 0.025 decimeters cubed, which is going to be 0.000025 meters cubed. You can write that in standard form if you prefer. So this is a really important conversion to understand. And with pressure, volume, number of moles and R done, temperature is last. So temperature's SI unit is Kelvin and Degrees and Kelvin do not differ in their increment, only in their beginning. So degrees have a negative value, but the difference between 1 and 0 is equal for both degrees and Kelvin. It's just the absolute 0, given in Kelvin, is minus 273.15. Just minus 273 will be fine for the IB. The point being is the increment is the same only the start point. So all you have to do to convert from degrees to Kelvin is add 273 and to convert from Kelvin to degrees is take away 273. For example, two degrees is 275 Kelvin. So now we know the equations and the units, let's think about how these terms interact with each other. So if we consider PV equals NRT and then rearrange it for each of the relationships you want to investigate, we can first investigate how pressure is going to change when volume is changed. Rearranging the equation to give P, we find that volume is on the bottom of the fraction. So as we increase volume, the term on the right hand side of the equation is going to slowly get smaller. In fact, it's going to get smaller exponentially and give us a curve like this. We can try the same when we look at how volume is affected by temperature. Looking at volume, we can see that temperature is on the top of the fraction. So as we increase temperature, we're going to increase that overall term. And so we get a linear relationship between volume and temperature. Finally, we can do the same, again rearranging for pressure, but this time looking at how temperature will affect it. Well, we can see it's on the top of the fraction. So we're going to have the directly proportional relationship we had with our second graph. So before we get stuck into calculations, let's just do a question on what we've done so far. So for which set of conditions does a fixed mass of an ideal gas have the greatest volume? Pause the video. Pop them up. So using our ideal gas equation, we rearrange it for volume and we find that T is on the top and V is on the bottom of the fraction, which means that in order to get the highest value of V, we're going to need T to be very large and V to be very small. So looking here, we know it's going to be C or D, and we can see that it is going to be D. So let's have a look at some calculations. Now, I've used this example here because these molecular mass questions often give students a little bit of difficulty, but I'm sure after this, we'll find them no problem. So we get given a mass of an unknown gas and it asks us to find the molecular mass. So we we'll go, well, where's molecular mass in PV equals NRT? Well, this is where we've got to think about our mole journey. Everything relates to moles. So let's find our number of moles and then our molecular mass from that. So Using the rest of the information in the question, we've got a volume and we've got a temperature given as well. We're going to rearrange PV equals NRT so that we get N. But first, we're going to get all of our units correct. 
So we've got volume given to us in centimeters cubed. So to get that in meters cubed, we're going to divide that by 1 million, which is going to give us 8.46 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. So our volume and our temperature are fine. Our pressure is given as a standard pressure. We know is 100,000 pascals. Temperature is 500 Kelvin and R is always 8.31. So write our equation out to find N and then plug in the values that we've converted to our correct standard SI units into that equation. So we get 100,000 multiplied by 8.46 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 8.31 times 500. That's going to give me my number of moles as 0 0.02036 moles. And from earlier in the unit, we know that molecular mass is going to be mass over moles. So we get 1.038 grams divided by 0 0.02036, which gives us a molecular mass of 51 grams per mole. Awesome. So in this next example, we're trying to find pressure. They've given us number of moles of CO2, and we've also got the volume, and we've got the temperature. So of course, we're going to be using PV equals NRT, and we're going to be rearranging that to give us just pressure, NRT over V. But let's get all of our units in order first. So get our volume divided by 1 million to get us into meters cubed. R is 8.31 as usual. Number of moles given in the question is 45.4. And the temperature is 50 degrees C. So I add 273 gives me 323 Kelvin. So now we're on a roll. We just pop all these values into our rearranged equation and solve to get pressure. So we've got NRT over V, which is three times 10 to the minus three, which ends up being rather large because we're just doing it in Pascals. So it's just over 40 million Pascals. So the last thing I'd like to cover is the initial and final ideal gas law. So when we think about PV equals NRT, if we rearrange for things that stay constant within a question, so have NR equals to PV equals over T. Well, we can say that if that stays constant, then as those change over the course of a reaction, they must stay also equal to NR if the number of moles stays the same. And so this allows us to rearrange the equation as I'm showing here to give us P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And what this allows us to do is allows us to answer questions about what happens if these things change in the course of a reaction. The best part is if there is no change, we can just cancel the term that doesn't change. For example, volume. If it doesn't change, we don't need to include it in our calculation. Let's have a look at an example here. So here we've got the temperature is given to us as the initial and we say we're increasing the volume and it asks us what temperature will the gas have its original pressure. Now that means that P is not changing, pressure is not changing. So when I write out my overall equation, I know that because P isn't changing, I can just cancel that out. So I'm going to get V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Then I'm just going to plug in my values as they are given to me in the question. So let's just write those down in the correct units first. So I've got volume 3 times 10 to the minus 3 initially, and then 6 times 10 to the minus 3 at the end. The temperature is 3 to 7 Kelvin, and we're trying to find the final temperature. So then I just take these values and I plug them into my equation over here. So I am going to get 6 times 10 to the minus 3 over T2, and then I rearrange to find T2 as the subject of the equation, which gives me 6 times 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by 327 divided by 3 times 10 to the power negative 3, which equals 654 Kelvin. 
quick question on that then. What will happen to the volume of a fixed mass of gas when its temperature and pressure are both doubled? Pause the video. Pop them up. So, of course, using that same relationship that we just outlined, P1, V1 equals T1 over P2, V2 over T2, we can see that if pressure and temperature, which pressure is on the top of the fraction and temperature is on the bottom of the fraction, then if they are both multiplied by 2, then we will get no overall change. So the answer will be A. What's next? Well, there will be a video on determining the molar volume of a gas practical, and you will have to do the questions going alongside that in pages 18 and 19 of the practical workbook. Until then, questions in the worksheet workbook for you to be getting on with and having some good practice time. Thanks again for joining me, guys. Make sure you like, subscribe, share the videos, and as always, practice makes slightly better.